today to have Hank Willis Thomas and Rejecko Hockley with, here with us. Um, before we get started, I would like to introduce Mr. Baloji Balogun of Chapel Hill Denham to make a few brief remarks. Thank you so much, Tayo, and I hope you're keeping well. I am, thank you. Nice to very, have very, you. Very, very good. Um, firstly, let me thank you and to thank um, the founder of Artex, you know, Ms. Sokini Peter Side, for giving us an opportunity to be involved um, in Artex this year. And really, very, very delighted, um, you know, that Artex um, is holding, notwithstanding COVID. Um, I, I also want to say that, you know, I hope that everyone and all of their families, you know, are keeping, you know, well through what has been, you know, a very, very difficult season um, across the world. Um, really honored to have an opportunity to introduce um, this particular speaker session. Um, and perhaps I might start, um, you know, by um, introducing and, you know, welcoming, albeit virtually to Lagos, um, Rujeko Hockley. Very, very delighted to meet you, Rujeko, and, um, you know, really honored to have the opportunity to do this introduction. Um, also very, very honored to welcome Hank Willis Thomas. And I understand that congratulations are in order. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've seen some news. Um, you know, about, you know, an award that you've just been nominated for. Um, and it really speaks a lot to, um, you know, what you do and how you do it. Artex for all of us is, 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 is more than art. It's, it's really a, you know, a passion. Um, it's, it's, you know, um, something that as a firm we've been involved, um, you know, from the very first year and we're really delighted you know, that Tokeni and all the wonderful people at Artex continue to give us an opportunity um, to do so. And I want to thank you all. And I hope that, um, you know, we will have the opportunity of having you both visit Lagos um, sometime in the not too far future. Um, for those of us, this time of the year in Lagos is always an exciting time. And we think Lagos is very much the center of the world. And I hope that you have the opportunity of visiting next year. Thank you both and really delighted to have this honor. Thank you, Tayo. Thank you very much, Mr. Balogun. Great. I'm Tayo Ogumbi and I'm head of curatorial here at Artex Lagos. And as I earlier said, we're so glad to have the opportunity to host this conversation. So I'll do a brief introduction uh, for those of you who do not know our, our panelists today. Rujeka Hockley was born in Zimbabwe and is currently based in New York City, where she is an assistant curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, Hank Willis Thomas also is based in New York City, is married to Rue, and um, is a very accomplished conceptual artist. Uh, so we'd like to get right into the conversation. And Hank, I'll start with you. I would love to, for you to share a bit about um, your using photography um, as an undergrad and how your relationship with that medium has shifted over the course of your career. Mm 
Oh, Hank, you're on mute. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you, Mr. Balgun, for the uh, introduction um, and welcome. I am grateful to be here doing a talk with my wife. I don't know, have we done talk the talk before together? I mean, we must have, but I don't know. I don't think so, <laughs> so I think this is our first time speaking well, publicly together. So, um, it, it, it might be actually. So thank you, Tayo, for having <laughs> us, for inviting us. Yeah, so that's, that's a really wonderful opportunity. And um, I want to acknowledge that I am married to a curator, but I'm also the son of a curator. Her name is Deborah Willis. Uh, she is also a photographer and art historian. And much of my work, uh, if not all of it, it, is actually in response or in the legacy of either my, my wife or my mother. So I'm very much um, in conversation with uh, the, the critical minds that have kind of nurtured me uh, because I, I came to photography through my mother. I really did it pretty much subconsciously. I've always loved to stare and look at things critically and engage with the world through uh, a wandering. Uh, and uh, in the 1990s when I was in college, I, there was not digital photography. So it was very much an analog medium. So when you made a photograph, you didn't even really know actually what, how it would look or what would come of it until, you know, hours, if not days later, when you got the film back and were able to print and process it. And right around the time that I graduated, digital cameras came online. And um, then soon after, uh, when I was in graduate school, we had cell phones with cameras and the medium that I come to love bec largely because of the patience that it, it allowed me became very much about instant gratification, not gratification, but instant awareness or capturing and therefore the looking became more shallow. And there are now more photographs taken in, in a millisecond than any of us could really make sense of in our entire lives, maybe even on our phones. And so <laughs> I, 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 I've started to reconsider my uh, relationship to photography and think of um, the, the lens uh, in a very different way. And so that might take the form of a collaborative art project or a sculpture or a video art or a conversation. And so I, I've done my best to, to grow with the times. <laughs> and um, although I do miss many elements of uh, the previous kind of relationship I had with photography, the dark room, et cetera. I also recognize how much water we were wasting, how many chemicals we were pouring down the drain. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hank. And Rujeko, a bit of an introduction from you. If you could tell us a bit about how you came to become a curator, um, what led you to that decision, whether there were moments in your life that, um, would have you where you are today? Um, certainly, uh, there are so many moments. Um, I think though my parents are not in the art world in the same way that my mother-in-love is, Deborah Willis, um, they encouraged me from a very young age to do what I was interested in and to kind of pursue my interests. And we, I was born in Zimbabwe, but we came to the United States when I was two to Washington DC um, and I spent a lot of my childhood in the Smithsonian in all of their various I will say very importantly free museums um, and so I really think about I was going to museums very early I was going to kind of the zoo to the aquarium to the planetarium um, and really was exposed to the kind of what that type of civic culture what that type of kind of public space um, really can be and can can look like, especially for an immigrant family that maybe wouldn't have access otherwise. Um, so that's really important. And then I think, you know, I was a dancer growing up. I was a person who was in the arts, who was creative thinking, wanting to be kind of engaged 
realized I wasn't going to be an artist myself at some point, you know, if luckily, you know, it wasn't too crushing, <laughs> but I did have to have that realization. Um, and when I went to college, I studied art history, which was not a discipline that I had really ever heard of prior to starting um, university. Um, I went to Columbia here in New York, and it was kind of a required course that I was just kind of blind, mind blown by. Um, and then I worked at the Studio Museum, which is where I know you from mm -hmm. um, many, many years ago. Um, and that is another really important kind of moment and turning point, I think, in my life generally. I met Hank. Hank and I met actually at the Studio Museum, the first show I ever worked on as a curatorial assistant is a show that Hank was in called Frequency. So quite literally my, my life, my personal life, my professional life, uh, my family is very deeply connected to the Studio Museum um, and to all the, that whole kind of huge proliferating family of people do in the world. Um, but yeah, I think the Studio Museum is where I really learned both what it meant to be a curator um, and that there were kind of different ideas around perhaps what it means to be a curator. There are people who are very object oriented. I think the discipline, the field has historically been very object oriented. And I think there are also curators that are very artist oriented. Um, and, you know, a balance is ideal, but I think if I had to kind of wait slightly, I really endeavor to be artist oriented. Um, and that is something that I really learned at the Studio Museum from Thelma Golden, from Rashida Bombre, from Christine Kim, from Hank, and all the artists that were in Frequency. Great, thank you so much, Rajeko. It's really interesting to hear you speak about those foundational years at the Student Museum. And I'm wondering if your, how your practice as a curator has shifted since you left. Um, so you talked about just now being object oriented. Um, what else do you think has come out with respect to the way that you curate and approach curating? Um, now that you've worked at three major art institutions in the United States. Yeah, um, and three quite different institutions. Um, I only worked at the Studio Museum for two years and change, and its footprint in my life has been kind of immense, which is testament, I think, to the important work that is happening there um, and has been happening there for over 50 years. Um, I think that how I has shifted perhaps is you know, I have a greater awareness of, of the platform that is afforded by institutions and by different institutions kind of variously um, and the different audiences that you may be able to reach with your work um, based on kind of the institution that you work at. But I also think that, and this is something that I learned from, I've learned from my mother and my father, from my education from many, many mentors and people, but the, you know, you know, I bring me wherever I go, you know, I am myself wherever I go. So the institutions are different and the audiences might be different, but my interests, my commitments, my priorities, my person, you know, the, myself, I, I am consistent in the same. And so I think, and that's definitely something that I think I've grown into more as hopefully we all do as we get older and more comfortable with ourselves. Um, so yeah, I think what I, what at the Whitney, I really, I want to be in service of artists. I really want to create opportunities. They create the opportunities. I want to be a channel, you know, I want to help kind of ease the way. I want to bring people in that maybe wouldn't be there otherwise, whether that be artists, audiences, um, community members, whoever it is um, on every level. So I think, yeah, that's something that I've thought consistently throughout my career is really important is what we kind of can do in those spaces. Thank you, Ujeko. Um, back to you, Hank. I wondered if you could speak a bit about your experiences uh, creating works to be shown both within institutions and outside of institutions and how um, you often use symbols, references, sometimes um, existing photographs to make reference to history and popular culture in your work in a way that's remarkably deep and accessible simultaneously, which for me is really the genius of what you do. So I'd love for you to speak about your process a bit in that context. I wish I could speak about my process in a way that um, was not dismissive, but it's kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> do stuff. That's not then, true. Well, I say that because, okay, Smarter person, go ahead, speak. 
That's smart. <laughs> you are the smarter person, especially when it comes to your work. But I, I, I think it's, it is true somewhat. Maybe there's not a predetermined plan is perhaps mm -hmm. more. Yeah, I think that comes because from my mother, I, I went to Duke Ellington School for the Arts in Washington, DC. And I was in the museum studies program in high school. And like Rue, I, I actually wound up going to the Smithsonian all the time. And my mother was working at the then National African American Museum Project, um, which is now the National Museum for African American History and Culture. Uh, the African Art Museum was relatively new at the time. And um, this, I was in the, in the, in the actual museum. Um, the museums have, discourse have changed <laughs> across the nation uh, around issues related to race, identity, gender. And that was kind of during this period of uh, multicultural awareness and awakening and new methods of presenting. And I learned through osmosis, through my mother, through my, my schooling, and also through, um, I think my father's way of learning, which he was a physicist and a, a jazz musician and filmmaker among other things. And, and uh, this curiosity of that kind of, is really about collecting ideas and, and, and trying to organize them in such a way that you can present them articulately for me, probably most manifested through photographs because those were that was the first language that I learned other than English. And I uh, think that my, my, and so therefore I wish I could have a methodical process whereas instead I'll see something and I'll think about it for years <laughs> and be like, is this something that is valuable? Is this something that will mean something beyond this current moment? Is it too cute, too fun, too exciting, uh, too pretty to have a lasting impact? Um, or is that why I should do it? <laughs> um, I, I've tried to, for different circumstances, use um, different method, different approaches to uh, image making to and image represent, representation to um, send messages to the future. And so my real uh, goal is to speak to my future self and to our, our, our daughter and to uh, her generation of people who um, I hope will evolve, have evolved past a lot of the issues that we are dealing with in this time, yet um, might need some markers like uh, we do, which is why I often look to the past um, as a means to um, kind of orient myself on, on, the, on this pathway towards uh, a future that I would be proud to be a part of. Thank you, Hank. And, you know, you talk about the past and the way you speak about it, it's, it reminds me of how collaboration um, has become an important way of working uh, for you, it seems. Um, thinking about the Four Freedoms Project, for those who don't know, um, Four Freedoms is a collaborative project that Hank co-founded in 2016 as Donald Trump's um, presidential campaign was gaining um, momentum. And uh, it uses public billboards, public spaces to invite the cultural sector, sector and a much wider public into conversations about social change and the state of um, society. So I wonder if you could speak a bit about collaboration, that project in particular, and any other moments in your career when collaboration um, was really key to executing your work. Yeah, well, and this again goes back to my mother. My mother, Deborah Willis, is doing a talk right now. Otherwise, she'd be here. So I'm just going to bring her here with <laughs> us and keep referring to her. Uh, but that was where she is my first teacher. I mean, my grandmother, of course, as well, and my, my larger family, my aunts. Uh, but um, I also, and I will say, in many uh, African and African diaspora communities, collaboration is not only uh, essential it's uh, it's like a, a given there's not a, a question that you know I am you and you are me or that we are uh, because we are <laughs> and uh, because in, in the context of my professional work I, I don't make anything alone I'm not a, 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 a artist to and I don't think anyone does actually I think even those who might be in the studio alone are actually in conversation with their ancestors and with others who they've encountered throughout their life. Uh, my, 
my mother being a curator, I, I realized that there she she was always collaborating. She was collaborating with artists like Carrie Mae Weems and Lorna Simpson and Clarissa Sly since I was a child, helping uh, uh, them and the institutions and the public uh, to create a broader dialogue uh, around issues uh, that are less often spoken about and. I think this idea of you have this talent, I have this talent, and I can maybe help. My talent might be just coordinating and helping <laughs> to present this thing in a way that's very effective is something that I really love to do. And so Four Freedoms um, really gives me an, op an opportunity as a curator to work with others who may not even see themselves as artists or a public they may not see themselves as art viewers to really uh, engage in the most essential element of art, which is to make political change. We forget often that without art, there is no culture, there is no civilization, and therefore it is the root of our society. And because we think of it often as a charity or something that is off to the side, uh, we have, have lost connection with um, the basic element of human experience, which is creativity. Thank you very much, Hank. Um, Rue, I would love to hear you speak about your work on We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985. And the work you did collaborating with artists um, mm -hmm. to bring to bear um, the underrepresentation of Black women and Black women's art um, in our contemporary moment. Yeah, um, that was a show that I, I co-curated with Catherine Morris at the Brooklyn Museum in 2017. Um, and, you know, I think this question of collaboration is a really important one because almost every, every show that has been of significance to me personally and that I think has, res that I've, that I have done and that has resonated, I think, with the kind of broader world, the most have been shows that I've co-curated with other really brilliant people. Um, and I don't think that's an accident. Um, and aside from that, if you are a curator at a museum, especially everything you do is a collaboration because if you, I mean, it doesn't even, nothing is gonna happen. Like you might have the idea, you might say this artist, you might reach out to the artist, but after that, like, good luck to you if you're not <laughs> working in collaboration with your colleagues because everybody from the art handlers, the registrars, the conservators, the educators, the um, front of house staff, the visitor service staff, the custodians, the security guards, like every single person who works at the museum becomes your collaborator in some way. And I think, you know, to the point of the people who've told me the most about my exhibitions and the ways that people experience them are often the guards. And nobody, or not nobody, but they are often not thought of as people who are part of the kind of collaborative process of creating an exhibition. But in fact, they are the ones who spend the most time with the, the work that you do. They're literally there all day, every day. Um, so I just want to preface it with that. We Wanted a Revolution was a show that was looking at this very kind of specific period, 1965 to 85, and thinking about the emergence of what in the US is called second wave feminism, kind of the mainstream like Gloria Steinem, you know, bra burning as a shorthand, even though the bra burning actually didn't happen, urban legend. Um, but that kind of mode of feminism and the ways in which it was not a universally applied or universally experienced or even universally appreciated um, movement, specifically Black women and other women of color, um, women of different classes, of different education experiences, um, immigration status, et cetera, all not necessarily being included. And so, but of course, also <laughs> seeing patriarchy and seeing the kind of inequalities and I was going to say inefficiencies, and that was a miss. I thought I was misspeaking, but I actually am not misspeaking. The inefficiencies of a culture and a society in which half of the population is seen as less than. Mm -hmm. It is an inefficient way to live. Mm -hmm. So the show was really trying to think about Black women as between kind of a rock and a hard place of the feminist movement, the mainstream feminist movement, and the civil rights movement, and the Black power movements as being kind of very largely led by men. Um, kind of subject to kind of a patriarchal point of view, though women were of course very important. And so what did these women do, these artists who were really invested in social change, invested in kind of in collaboration, in working in community, 
um, that's what they did. They made their own spaces, they made their own work, they relied on one another for childcare, they relied on one another for both profession, like professional feedback, you know, studio visits, critiques, as well as childcare, not seeing these as kind of some bifurcated, like I'm an artist over here and I'm a woman and a mother over here, but actually that's like the totality of my existence. I am all those things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that show, I was just saying to Hank actually the other day, I was just reading <laughs> like a nerd reviews of the catalog that I had never read. Um, and I was really moved by kind of what the pe what people said about the book then and that it's kind of still out in the world and that it still kind of has this really, and it's not like so long ago, but that it still has this kind of deep resonance. Um, it is kind of one of the most closest, the closest to my heart projects that I've worked on and one that really continues to kind of pay dividends in so many ways, whether that be people who reach out to me to say, oh my God, I just got this catalog, it's so amazing people who are still kind of looking, seeing the hashtag on Instagram, it had, we wanted, hashtag we wanted a revolution has a big footprint on Twitter and, and Instagram and still growing. Or artists who are in the show, um, somebody like Maren Hassinger comes to mind, um, an incredible sculptor, um, dancer, movement artist who we installed a sculpture that had been in storage in her storage unit in Baltimore literally since 1971 which was the last time it had, the one and only time it had been shown in the world was in a show at PS1 in, I, I believe, 1971 called Afro-American Abstraction. And then it went into storage. It was a very large piece, steel, kind of very hard to store, not the kind of thing that you can just be like, hey, like, can I put this in your show? But we brought it out of storage, or she did, you know, we at our request. Um, and that that piece was brought by MoMA out of the show and was installed when MoMA reopened their new galleries. That mm -hmm. piece is in the galleries at MoMA and MoMA is not the arbiter of all things great. So that's not the point <laughs> of the anecdote. I mean, it is, it's not the only one though, you know, that's what I'm saying. But what I mean is that like there were, there's been very, really amazing, some, both symbolic and tangible effects. Like Marin is an artist who's teaching, has been teaching at MICA for, 30, 40 years. She has an incredible like students who've come out um, who she's instructed, but she she didn't have a gallery. Like it's not easy to be an artist and it's not easy to be a woman artist, especially of a certain generation who has a child who is juggling so many things. So for her in her 70s to, to not only receive recognition, but also receive kind of financial support in in direct relation to that show is is incredibly meaningful to me because I really believe that we treat artists often like they don't have the same issues like bills and is, you know that they're not like people in the same way that everybody else is and so I really believe strongly in the compensation for their work we live in a capitalist society so that's the rubric by which we can show that we <laughs> it's not the only one but I'm not interested in artists um having great success, having great reviews, you know, having their work seen in institutions and be struggling to live um, their lives in the fullness that they deserve behind the scenes. Absolutely. So. And that's a nice segue into um, the Whitney Biennial and the stance um, you and your co-curator took in selecting the artists to invite for that to take part in that exhibition. Could you speak a bit about that and what led you to the decisions you made? Yeah, and that's another, I mean, the biennial is kind of always a co-curated experience, um, but I think a lot of the time the curators who were selected perhaps don't have, they may not have co-curated before. Um, and Jane and I both had, which I think was really, we were able to kind of jump in really quickly into a kind of dynamic and way of working that was very intuitive and collaborative and, and really fun. I mean, we had a great time, honestly. Um, so in thinking about the biennial, the way that we started kind of with our own, just like the like vomit, all the artists that you think <laughs> of, that you know, that you've met, that you haven't met, that you're interested in, that you're wondering about, that somebody told you was great, that you saw a show that one time, but never met them. So we just kind of did that. And then we compared our lists to see, just to have a place to start, you know, in terms of studio visits, in terms of, um, yeah, just, you know, it's a huge project, so it's hard to know where to start. And so we did that, and then we just made a list and just, just started at the beginning. Um, it was really important to us to not have a predetermined idea about what the biennial was going to be. Um, it was really important to us that we 
were led by the artists that we kind of selected people not to fit into some like idea that we had over here. So in a, in a very different kind of mode from making a thematic historical survey exhibition like We Wanted a Revolution where there was a thesis um, where we did have to think about not like who fits in the thesis, but like, how do you, like, like writing an essay, how do you build your point? You know, what do you include to kind of continue to elaborate and flesh it out for people? Um, but the biennial is not, is not a thematic. It is a survey, but it's not a thesis driven kind of, or, or it wasn't for us. I don't, I think in the end we came to several conclusions that were kind of threads that we had kind of populated throughout but we really wanted to start with a very open mind and very open eyes um, and really be led. Often artists led us to other artists um, and you know that was kind of an interesting process as well. And, and am I right in that you also thought about artists who were in debt, um, had like a lot of school debt. Um, was that coincidental or is that something that um, you, know, you wanted to make visible um, in the selection of artists? We didn't think about like artists who had debt per se, because I don't think you have to, because I think a lot of <laughs> artists have debt because of the kind of pedagogical system, especially in the United States um, of MFAs and the ways in which that works. Um, but no, I think what we were thinking about was that we felt like there was a real precarity um, that we were hearing a lot about in studio visits. And it wasn't just in New York and it wasn't just in LA and it wasn't just, um, you know, in Miami or wherever or in kind of cities or, you know, we traveled widely, we went to Puerto Rico, we went, you know, to Texas, we went, you know, all over the country and we kind of heard the same thing um, that people were struggling in a certain way. And, I, and, you know, of course, not just artists across the country, everyone, um, which has gotten even worse in the last year, of course, but, I think that we were very interested in thinking very, being kind of as open-eyed as we could about like what the biennial is and can be. Um, and we wanted to kind of expand and extend that opportunity to as many people as we could. And we were really interested in, in new names. We really wanted to, there, the biennial has gone through many iterations in the way it's organized over the years at the Whitney. And there was an era in which you know, one artist would be in like six biennials. And that was that was also, the, it was a much smaller art world. Like there's many reasons why that was. It's not just to be like, these are the only people we like. But we were really interested in challenging ourselves to, to not in the interest of like, ooh, the new, new, like we wanna like surprise people with these names they've never heard, but to really, to bring people into this experience and into this exhibition that hadn't been a part of it in the past. Um, even someone like Wageshi Mutu, we were appalled that she hadn't been in a biennial before. Mm. And Hank wow. actually, Hank is the person who pointed that out to me. Um, you know, that Wageshi, how has Wageshi not been in a biennial before? Um, and so, so even that, someone who's incredibly well known and successful, um, ex has exhibited on multiple continents um, all over the world, um, had not been in this, you know, survey of American art, this important show um, at, at the stage of her career. And so we were, and for us, we were like, oh, that's, we're lucky. We get to work with Wageshi. We get to put Wageshi Mutu in a biennial. I don't know what all these other people were doing, but you know. <laughs> I mean, and I have a lot of empathy for everyone. I mean, it's a really hard job and it's a really hard experience in many ways. So I have deep empathy for everyone who's ever done a biennial or will do one because you really don't know what you're doing. And there's a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Rodeco. You know, over the past few days and this year, we've had a lot of questions about storytelling through visual art. Um, and so I'd like both of you to comment on how you feel art can be used to actively address cultural power structures and criticize, scrutinize uh, policies, um, social structures uh, or lack thereof, um, rather than just visually representing them. Well, this connects directly to what Ruben was just talking about with the artists you chose for the biennial and what's, I think, happening in Nigeria, what's happening in France, what's happening in New York, I mean, in, I mean, in parts of the US. So why don't you talk about that experience, Ruben? Uh, 
Well, I think I think Hank is talking about, um, for example, forensic architecture in in the biennial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can chat. You can chat me in case I'm getting it wrong. Um, yeah, one of the artists, the collective, speaking of collaboration, that we included in the biennial is a group called Forensic Architecture, who are based in the UK. Um, but are composed of um, members from all over the world. Um, and the work that they do is really, I would say it, it operates in multiple different categories and spaces, including obviously the art space and the, the fine art space, but also the legal realm, um, surveillance. Um, they're very kind of, what they did for the biennial is, and not that we invited them, um, as just based on their work, past work, and they came to us wanting to make a new work um, based around Warren Canders, who had been, who was one of the Whitney's um, trustees, who's the CEO of Safari Land at the time, manufacturer of tear gas, which was used at the border in the US and in other spaces internationally and nationally. Um, Forensic Architecture made a film called um, Triple Chaser, Triple Canister, Triple Chaser. Sorry, the details are a little like not top of mind anymore on the titles, but um, they made a film that was using the technology that they had kind of worked out to track the times and places in which these very specific tear gas canisters had been used. Um, and so they made a film, which was a work of art, which was included in the biennial and, you know, beautiful black box installation. But it was really a piece of investigative kind of journalism um, and reporting and the kind of combination. It was also an aesthetic work of art, you know, thinking very much about how we share information, how we kind of instill people's, how we get people's hearts and minds engaged. Hank says, Triple Chaser, thank you. Um, <laughs> how we how we tell a story in a way that is both kind of dynamic and compelling, but also informative. Um, so, you know, the, the, the criteria are different than like a newscast, you know, a straight newscast, but a lot of things they submitted to, you know, international courts because they did research that hadn't been done before to track the use of these canisters, these tear gas canisters. Um, kind of culling from videos on YouTube, pulling, they made an algorithm to track kind of internationally all the times in which it had been used. Um, and they did that all kind of with their own resources on their own, um, with their own know-how. So yeah, forensic architecture is a really interesting, they cut many different ways around this question. Yeah, thank you so much, Rune. I think that I feel as though, you know, the art sector, uh, social um, interaction is also very impacted by what we read in the media and what is put out there for us to consume. And um, to that end, Hank, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the recent accolade has been awarded. Congratulations being on the Art, Art Review Top 100 list. Um, I wanted to know how you felt about that and uh, how you feel about these sorts of lists in general. Well, Black Lives Matter was number one. Yeah. Which I think, um, speaks to the importance of these lists to call attention to things that might otherwise go ignored. I think it is really nice um, for a publication or institution to, or a group of people to honor and highlight people that they feel like are impacting their work. Uh, I think when they become canonical and people are like, oh, this is the only list, you know, yeah. how come I'm not, all, how come I wasn't on the list last year? Why come, why am I going down the list? It's like, <laughs> that's their unique independent perspective. And I have just gotten inspired to make my own power 100 list. <laughs> you know, because, you know, there's, I think we live in this framework of, of scarcity that if I'm not in the Whitney Biennial that my wife curated, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, then I can't benefit, you know, but there's this other thing side of, you know, we live in an abundant world. We can acknowledge um, everyone. We don't necessarily have to rank them by number per se. However, um, it also does help sometimes to see how our values have changed. Uh, Me Too was number four, I think, in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the Glenn Lowry, who was number one last year, I think, who's the Director of MoMA is now number seven. Right. And, uh, not that I looked at the list. Right I now. mean, yeah, he didn't. <laughs> I, I look. I don't look. 
<laughs> but um, but there is this really kind of fascinating way in which you can it, you could probably do a unique forensic <laughs> study of the the trends or the values of the art world that kind of go unnoticed um, by just looking at the power list and um, also typically the the ethnicities of, of, of the people who are who are being highlighted, um, which has changed dramatically in just the past ten years. Right. Absolutely. But and me, me being on it and not my collaborators feels weird because it says Hangul Songs for Freedom. And like, I'm just a small or maybe big, but I'm, I'm just a part of this organization or, but, and, and I think there's undue, uh, I think this idea of an, a, a genius auteur um, sometimes overshadows and undermines the work, um, which is really about um, what we all can bring to the table when we check our egos at the door. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hanke. And, you know, Rujeka, with your experience in, in various museums that, that as you've said, um, are quite different, mm -hmm. I wonder what more you feel museums can do um, to represent a more diverse cross-section of the public and a more diverse uh, selection of public interests. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think museums can do, I think museums do a lot. And I think they can do a lot more. Um, one of the things that I said kind of over and over and over again during the course of the kind of various controversies that unfolded during our biennial in relation to, to Warren Kanders um, and all of that um, is that the fact that we have people in our lobby protesting once a week for over two months, the fact that we have the fact that people care what we do, not in an ego driven way, like, oh, the Whitney is so special, but in a sense of like, people think that in museums matter. They think that these cultural spaces are important. They think that the work we do here is important. That is why they are here. Mm -hmm. And so, in, and we can take from that, wow, we have a great responsibility. We really have to live up to these standards that are being you know, this, this is a huge responsibility that's being placed on us. Like people really believe in us. We really need to live up to it. Or we can feel like persecuted and like, oh, poor us. Like, why are they harassing us? Like, this is not, you know, what can we do? You know, and so I think that that, I, I was really trying to stand and it was hard. It was very, very hard. So it's not like every day I was like, I am standing in my power. I am feeling the responsibility. Like I often was like, I hate this. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to work. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Hank remembers that part. Yeah, I Hank remembers that part. I, and then everybody I else saw the like, <laughs> we're really, we, we can do it part. Um, it was really hard, but I did really try to hold on to that. But like the fact that we, not just the Whitney, but all museums, cultural institutions are being subject to critique is a testament to the fact that people believe in us and they need us and they want us to do better. Mm -hmm. So I think to me that feels like exciting. It feels like sometimes one of the things that at least I worry about or yeah, worry about is like, is this relevant? Like, should I be doing something else? And like the world is so, has so many problems. There's so much need. There's so much that is wrong, like is a museum, is art really the place to kind of try to enact change when people don't have enough to eat, like people don't have clean water, like people don't have enough, people don't have health care, like people, you know, like there are so many basic needs that are going unmet in the United States, which is the richest country, not only in the world, but in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So I kind of struggle with that, but I think that what I come back to is that I, exactly what Hank said earlier is that without art, we have no culture. Without artists, we have no society on some fundamental level. I think that what drew me to art history as an undergrad was this kind of amazing realization that art is one of the things that all human civilizations do. Yeah. Like it, we eat, we breathe, we have sex, we have children, we, like work, I wouldn't even put work into one of them, art. We make art, we express ourselves creatively in all sorts of different ways, whether that be music, visual arts, dance, um, you know? And so I think like it is, a, it's clearly a deep foundational 
need of our species. And so I think that is kind of what keeps me going. And museums are not the only place, obviously, to have that be brought out into the world. But I think they're one um, that for me, the calculus that I make is, is around the platform, which I kind of mentioned earlier, it is around how do you reach the most people the most times. Um, and museums give you that platform um, and have that audience. Um, I think in terms of what we can do, I think a lot of the work is being done. And I don't think people talk enough about, we have a lot, it's like, again, it's this idea of the single auteur. We talk a lot about curators. We talk a lot about curatorial departments and we don't talk nearly enough about educators and about mm -hmm. education departments. Um, because I think, and I was on a panel with Tom Finkelpearl um, who, uh, is an incredible advocate of the arts, arts worker in New York City for many, many decades. Uh, the husband of my former boss, Eugene Tsai at the Brooklyn Museum, really both incredible um, contributors to the landscape in New York and at large. But I was on a panel with him once and he was like, I think the most innovative work coming out of museums is happening in education departments. Why don't we talk about that? And I was like, that's true. Mm. That's true. Like my colleagues at the Whitney in Education are thinking they have pivoted so incredibly seamlessly to an entirely virtual presentation. The programming is incredibly rich. It's incredibly dynamic and amazing people talking. Um, sh they're showing films, they're doing art making at home, like they're engaging with students. They're still engaging with schools. They created a whole um, like curriculum for school, for public, or not, for any teacher, not just public school teachers, not just New York City an arts curriculum to use because the museum is such a resource in the city for public schools, especially. And now that, or at that time, schools were closed and it's a huge, you know, parents were using it, teachers are using it. And so they're really thinking about access. Like access, I think is one of the next really important questions that not just the art world, but the world at large is how do we think about like, do we have an interpreter? Like we don't have an interpreter in this talk, for example, we don't have closed captioning. Um, how do we, what are we doing when we're, it's the same thing when I was talking about, about feminism and half the world being kind of left out of the equation. It, it's, it's a similar thing. Like if we want to reach more people, if we want more people to come to us, we have to go to them and make it so that they actually can be here, mm -hmm. you know? And it's not on them to do that. It's on us to do that. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Lou. Hank, uh, a last question from me uh, for you, um, and, and that's in response to something you said um, as part of your virtual tour for your uh, career retrospective, which closed at the Cincinnati Art Museum at the beginning of November. Congratulations on that. It looked wonderful virtually. Um, but you mentioned you're still trying to figure out what you're doing, and I loved that, um, especially that being paired with a retrospective um, that shows all that you've done. So I wondered if you could speak to what you hope to achieve. Um, if you can put words to it, um, we'd love to hear. What I hope to achieve in what? In your work, in your life, it can be anything. I have to ask you that first. <laughs> because I believe that most questions are directed towards ourselves. Mm. So what do you- <laughs> He's like, oh, really? Because I'm the moderator. <laughs> I am not prepared to talk about myself. <laughs> That's a colonial structure. Anyway. Let's go. Tell me what is it, what it? Well, I think you guys know, I met, I met you in New York and I'm really, it is not about me, but part of my being here in Lagos is to really see how I can contribute to the visual arts sector here and also build bridges uh, between what is happening locally and what's happening internationally. Because I think there are a lot of uh, synergies, there are a lot of commonalities. There are a lot of artists here who are really keen to gain a better understanding of how they can make work that is critically engaged. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how, that's my position, you know, off the cuff. So Hank. Well, you, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have the answer. Uh, it's, it's true. I mean, that's that's why we do it. I think there is the the road to progress is always under construction. You know, we are uh, creating. We're like a, a, a global. Our network is like a brain where we have new 
synapses firing and connect making connections all around the world and uh, ideas travel like people and I hope that through my work um, and through opportunities like the one you provided for us here that you know these ideas can circulate even more even better and, and so my show was called all things being equal dot 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 with an ellipsis because the struggle continues and I hope to um, have the energy uh, to contribute constructively to it as we move forward and make it even more beautiful. Thank you very much, Hank. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in here. Anyone else would like to ask our panelists questions, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, the first one here is for Rojeko. Um, after you worked at the Student Museum, you moved to Southeast Asia for a year and a half to teach English. How did this affect your curatorial practice and perhaps cause you to reinvent yourself? Um, that is a great question. Um, yeah, I moved to Laos. I worked at the Student Museum for two years and then I moved to Laos for a year and a half um, and then came back and so on and so forth. But I think that the time that I spent in Vientiane and Laos is really important for many reasons. One of the really big reasons is because I think many of us um, grow up with this idea that we have to kind of keep going on a certain path. Otherwise we won't succeed. Otherwise we won't be able to achieve our goals or fulfill our dreams or fulfill the expectations that other people have of us um, because so much has been put into us, whether that be our parents, our teachers, our family, ourselves. Um, so going to Laos was really important to me because I, I had so much anxiety and fear that I was like throwing away this amazing opportunity. You know, I have this job at the studio museum, like there's so few jobs in our field. You know, people are, would love to have this job. And I am like, oh, I'm like feeling like quarter life crisis. Like I had wanted to go abroad before I got that job, but then I got that job and was like, well, yeah, I'm gonna do this. Um, and I had grown up traveling with my parents um, because they worked in international development. And I don't know, I wanted to go somewhere. I wanted to travel somewhere I hadn't been like with my parents, <laughs> Southeast Asia. I wanted to live somewhere I hadn't been with them. I wanted to do my like my own thing, I guess. Um, but I was really scared that I was like never gonna get a job again or you know, everyone that I knew from the studio museum was gonna think I wasn't like a serious person or that I was throwing away this amazing opportunity they'd given for me, to me and why did they like invest in me anyway if I was just gonna like walk away. To this day, like one of the scariest things that I've ever done professionally was give notice to Christine um, Kim. I still, I can remember like the, it took me like a week to build up to it. I was supposed to do it on Monday. I think I did it like Thursday at like five o'clock. Um, probably cause she wasn't going to be in the office on Friday. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot live with this until next week. Um, so yeah, it was really, and, and all, and as soon as I told her, she was like, oh, this is amazing. Of course, have fun. Like, this is a great thing to do. This is really smart to like take a minute to do something different, to experience a different part of the world, a different way of life, a different profession. Um, and Thelma said exactly the same thing. Like, oh, you'll be back at verbatim. You'll be back. That's fine. <laughs> End of conversation. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, uh, okay. I mean, I'll just go like cry anxiety tears in the in the hallway now. <laughs> like, I've like built it up into this huge thing. Um, and yeah, so that's one thing that was really important about it. It was really a very valuable lesson in that there are no steps off. It's your path. You're on, you're making it. So okay. wherever you go, you're on your path. Um, and so that was really important to me to learn um, for myself at a relatively young age. I, I was like 24. Oh. Um, and it also, yeah, I mean, I, I went and I went with my then boyfriend at the time. So I kind of had friends, but kind of not. I really had to make my own life. Like I like learned to ride a motorbike. I had to like a totally different culture. Totally. I didn't like, I took Lao lessons. I was not very good. And I am now like have nothing. Sorry, sadly to my teacher. He was really, <laughs> he tried really hard. Um, you know, so I, I grew up a lot, I think while I was in Laos and I learned a lot of skills that were my skills, things I had to teach myself or I had to pursue, find someone to, to buy a motorbike from, to teach me how to use it, find someone to teach me the, the lessons, 
you know, schedule it, make sure I, they came every week, like, you know, just like life, it's not like anything profound, but just, and live in a world in a totally different country that I had never been to. Um, that I think importantly was not like a white and black, white or black space in terms of ethnicity, even though everyone in Laos is, is brown. In fact, most of the people in the world, as we know, are brown, whether they are whatever quote unquote race they are. Um, but I think, yeah, all of those things were really important and freeing. Um, and I learned a lot. I traveled in Southeast Asia. Um, I realized, and I think this is when I went to grad school in, in California, it was reinforced more, but like the majority of the world are people of Asian descent. Um, we don't think about that in the United States, at least I will say that for the United States, I can't speak to other places. Um, you know, grad school in San Diego, San Diego, the Asian descended peoples, Asian Americans are the predominant non-white ethnicity in Southern California. So like, it just really helps me reframe a lot of my conversations around race, around equity, around kind of what, yeah, what should we be talking about and who are we really talking about and who are we not talking about? Um, and in terms of being a curator, yeah, I think I came back and felt like, okay, yes, I do still wanna do this with my life. I do wanna go to grad school in art history. I do wanna work at museums again. I would like to, you know, have a slightly higher position and make more money. So I'm going to go to grad school and see if that helps. <laughs> um, so yeah, I felt like kind of a recommitment to doing it. And I was really, yeah, I felt like I, I, I did something important and I love teaching English. I had amazing students. I really love. And then when I went to teach in grad school, I was a TA. Yeah. A lot of those skills I learned teaching English were very applicable teaching English to from five-year-olds to 75-year-olds. Wow. Yeah. And it's a beautiful country and an incredibly interesting history, obviously in relation to the United States, but just on its own, nothing to do with the, with the American war, um, as they call it there. Um, it's a really rich and deep and really beautiful culture. And I learned, yeah, I, which I had no exposure to um, in terms of the religion, in terms of the food, in terms of the kind of way of life, it all was really new to me. And I really, yeah, I loved it and still really appreciate that time. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple questions here about, but well, I'm just gonna spin them to ask how your respective practices um, impact one another and the work that you do. Um, you know, what collaboration looks like between the two of you. I know it's something that we've talked about extensively in this conversation but not with respect to the two of you together. Ironically, let's put it this way. This is our first talk together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe this is just the beginning of collaboration. Um, uh, I would say, you know, we tacitly inform each other's work. Um, I'm much more like, come and play with me. And she's much more like, I am reading this, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did you say something? Sorry. This <laughs> and then I go, have my feelings hurt and make her try to make, try to make her feel bad. <laughs> you know, I'm the artist. So Pis like, Pisces Aquarius, the Pisces Aquarius foundational issues. <laughs> um, but we're, you know, I think we're both learned, leaning into our Piscean, our relative Piscean Aquarian natures, leading away from the predominant side to closer to each other. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, we have not ever collaborated in a like formal official way. Like there's no project that is like, here's the thing we did together. But I think there's a lot of, for, for me at least, I think Hank is very influential in my thinking um, in kind of the way that I, it is, you learn a lot more, I would say about how to work with artists if you are very, if you live with one. <laughs> Uh, but I, was no, I, say, I say that really with, because I think like what I learned, what I have learned, and I, I mean this in the most kind of like affirming and positive way, what I have learned from living with loving an artist, building a life with an artist is that there's no like my art is over there and I'm over here. So when you're, it's like I thought of this thing in my head 
or it, it came through me somehow, whether I myself made it or a fabricator made it, whether it's a collaboration, whether it's just me, whatever the circumstances of it, it is like a part of me. And it's three o'clock in the morning and you should talk to me about it. That part, <laughs> I don't, yeah, that part, no. But, uh, but, but no, uh, just to like, take it, like t hold it tenderly. Like as a curator, like as a, it, you know, like respect that this is not just like an idea somebody had on the fly. It's like, it means something. It came from them. It like is of them and, you know, respect it, hold it like tenderly, like really cherish it and be, be gentle and be sensitive because it's not just like, and cause art, you know, as Erica Badu said, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about, sensitive about my shit. Like that's, it's true. And, and, and I, sh I should say though that we have launched two collaborations together in the past year, two years. Yeah. The first one is our daughter, uh, and her name is Zenzi, and uh, parenting, of course, is a collaboration. The greatest collaboration. It really I does ever have. <laughs> inform and shape everything, and she's a great. She and Rue are great teachers, and what dedication and commitment and joy mean. And uh, I think I have been informing them both about uh, responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, but this kind of way in which, you know, sometimes I take myself way too seriously and that um, needs to be let go. And sometimes, um, you know, there's a, especially as the father, it's a very different thing when you're like, I'm just over here. <laughs> you know, but it's really exciting. Um, and that's an awesome collaboration. And then the other one is called The Wide Awakes, which um, everyone in 2020 has had an awakening. And um, Four Freedoms um, has a very American focused practice. And uh, we realize that um, there are need, there are opportunities and needs for greater. Um, <laughs> and more infinite um, disorganized uh, methods of collaboration. And so I'm curious, Rue, if you could talk about that collaboration. Yeah, the Wide Awakes, I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking about that earlier. Your first question, Tayo, when Hank was like, I don't think about it in advance. I just do yeah. it <laughs> practice. That is simultaneously true. But the, the deeper kind of more complex truth is, and the Wide Awakes is an exact example of this, is that he, will have, will see something or research something or read about something and it's like filed away, but it's not gone. And it's like percolating, 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 percolating. And then it like comes out and it's this fully formed kind of idea, not exactly fully formed what it's gonna look like or what it's gonna be, but like the heart of it is there. And the wide awakes really was that and is that because the wide awakes were in 1860 or on the election of Abraham Lincoln in the United States, they were a youth Basically, basically a youth activist group um, that was formed to protect abolitionist candidates. And they wore capes and they carried lanterns. They had all of these incredible slogans. They had incredible kind of graphic designers and iconography, the eye that you might've seen on a lot of, and of course the eye has deep um, cultural and historic roots all over the world going back mm -hmm. millennia. So it's obviously they didn't kind of make that up, but that was their kind of symbol, the open eye were wide awake. Um, and so Hank saw, I believe, like an, a picture of them. And they were just incredibly striking, like these young, mostly white, but not exclusively white men wearing oil cloth capes, carrying lanterns, like looking, you know, in this 1860 photography kind of way, just really intense. Um, and he, for like a decade, has been thinking about the wide awakes and what, it do, what to do with the wide awakes and what what it is it is it the iconography is it is it using the photography is it using the archive is it oh wait creating a global movement of people all over the world that are committed to social justice and the idea of awakening in yourself and in society yeah let's do that last one um and have and event, yeah and, and carnival is that's the other part um trinidad carnival um but also um all of the kind of carnival uh, celebrations in Brazil, uh, Mardi Gras, like all have this root in liberation, um, in kind of social justice. Most of them are connected back to enslaved people um, and otherwise subjugated people's expression of freedom in the face of extreme oppression. Um, 
So they all have this incredible history. And, and of course, the, the costuming, the regalia, the idea that you kind of, it's not that you're hiding yourself, but that you put something on to like become more yourself. And so we, we are our own superheroes is kind of one of the things that we've been saying a lot, which of course this year, I don't think any, it resonates even more than it might have otherwise in a year in which for in both positive and negative ways, I think people the world over have felt like it's just, it's me. Like I'm the one who has to, to do it. Whether that's, you know, safeguard my family, take care of myself, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, I think the, the wide awakes, it's been, it's been really fun and it's been really inspiring um, to, to see more closely, I think the way that it all kind of unfolds and unspools um, and to see people kind of get excited and take it up on their own. Like there's like wide awakes accounts, Instagram accounts all over the world, like wide awakes, Cuba, wide awakes, Australia, wide awakes, many across the United States, um, wide awakes, London, maybe there's going to be a wide awakes Lagos now. We don't know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the Wide Awakes, it is, it has been really fun and really inspiring. And I think a real light in a very strange year. Um, yeah. So I think that, that is a collaboration. And Zenzi also, 100%. She counts. Great. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today, for making the time. Um, we're so grateful to have your insights. And, um, you know, I'd like to thank you both for being so generous with with your feedback and, and responses to the questions posed. So thank you. We hope to see you in Lagos in person one of these days. Likewise. So I've never been. Um, I know. It's terrible. Yeah, it's not so, terrible. It's coming. It's, it's, <laughs> it's coming in the future, yes. Maybe the best for last. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, you guys. And sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. There were quite a few, but we did our best. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Heiko. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So nice Bye. to see you, Tayo. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Bye.